15. Okay, hello. Um, I have a, a question for you. In fact, I'll go to my first slide. Can the mind heal us? Um, this is the question that I set out to answer in my book, Cure, and um, it's a very controversial topic. Of course, on, on one side, you, we get a lot of claims of, of miracle cures, often from alternative therapists, um, pushing the, the idea that we can cure pretty much anything, even serious conditions like cancer, with um, enough positive thinking. On the other, on the other side, there are sceptics who would insist that any suggestion of healing thoughts is deluded, dangerous quackery. But it seems to me that both groups are kind of basing their arguments on the idea that the, the influence of the mind over the body is some sort of mysterious, magical force that, that operates outside of the normal rules of science. And, and I, I really don't think that that's, that's right. I'm, I'm hoping to um, convince you today that the, the mind's role in our health is not mysterious or magical. It, it's just biology, and we can study it scientifically. So I'm going to talk today about just one line of research that I describe in the book, and I also wrote about it for Mosaic, um, and, and look at how we can use this to, to take advantage of the mind in medicine. So this research all started with, a, with an experiment that went wrong. Um, a psychologist in the 1970s called Robert Ada was interested in a phenomenon called learned taste aversion. Um, and it's something that a lot of you might be familiar with. Basically, if you eat a food like prawns uh, and then you're sick, then the next time you're faced with that food, just the very the taste of it, or the very thought of it even, can make you feel sick again. And there's a survival value to that. If you've been poisoned in the past by a certain food, it discourages you from eating that food again in the future. And Ada was interested in how long that learned association between the taste and feeling sick would last. So he did an experiment with some rats. He fed them water that was sweetened with saccharin. And this is usually a favourite treat for the rats. They love that sweet taste. But in this experiment, he gave it to them along with a drug, an immunos uh, sorry, with a drug called um, cytoxan. And that this drug makes them feel sick. Um, and he gave them the sweetened water along with the drug a few times. Um, and after that, they refused to drink the sweetened water on its own when it was given to them without the drug. And so he force-fed it to them with an eyedropper to see how long it would take them to forget that association. But they didn't forget it. Um, one by one, the rats fell ill and they died, um, which kind of seems a bit like black magic or something, but it, but it isn't. It, what, what it turned out was happening was that cytoxan is, as well as making the rats feel sick, it's an immunosuppressant. And it turned out that the rats, as well as learning to associate that sweet taste with feeling sick, they also learned the immune response to that drug. And once they'd learned that association, just the sweet taste on its own was enough to suppress their immune systems so that they succumbed to infections and died. So a neutral psychological cue, the sweet taste, was in this case enough to kill. And there have been other experiments showing the reverse, that you can use um, learned associations to boost the immune system and save lives. Um, there was one research with guinea pigs where researchers heated the, the animal's skin um, a, alongside giving them an injection that triggered a particular immune response. And later, when they heated the skin alone, that helped those animals to survive what would normally be a fatal injection of cholera. Um, and these learned associations are examples of classical conditioning. So it's pretty much the same that was going on with Pavlov's dogs. So the physiologist Ivan Pavlov taught dogs to associate being fed with a neutral cue, like a sound or a light, so that then they learn to salivate just automatically in response to that sound or light. The food didn't need to be there anymore. And this works on people too. Um, I would like to invite you to imagine taking a big bite out of this lemon. So imagine, visualise sinking your teeth into it, swallowing that juice, and you might start to feel a tingling at the back of your tongue, anyone? Um, and that is your salivary gland starting to work to produce saliva in preparation for swallowing the acidic juice. And you wouldn't be able to do that if I asked you. If I said, please switch on your salivary glands, you wouldn't be able to do it. But by visualising the lemon and using that learned association, you can trigger it automatically. It doesn't matter that you know that's not a real lemon. It happens anyway. Um, and 
Pavlov, with his experiments, showed for the first time that the brain controls the digestive system. Um, Ada, in his work, showed that conditioned responses don't just influence salivation and digestion, they can guide immune responses as well. And in the 1970s, when he did this work, that was seen as pretty much pseudoscience. Um, at the time, it was thought that the immune system responds solely to physical signals, things like infection and injury. Um, there wasn't any known way that the brain and the immune system could communicate with each other. Um, but we now know that there is actually extensive two-way communication between the brain and the immune system, um, and that happens via nerves of the autonomic nervous system and also chemical messengers, neurotransmitters and cytokines. And this is important for our survival. The immune system is using psychological cues about our environment, about the situation that we're in, to get one step ahead of threats that we're about to face. So an obvious example of that is the fight or flight response. When we're afraid or, or anxious, the fight or flight response triggers a branch of the immune system called inflammation. It's the body's first line of defense against infection or injury. So we've already mounted that response in advance of getting injured or infected so that the immune system is ready to face that. And learned associations do a very si similar thing, but in a more specific way. So if you imagine eating those prawns and then getting sick, say, with salmonella infection, the next time you're faced with prawns, you might feel sick, but your body may also have learned the appropriate immune response that you needed to that infection the last time round. So when you face the prawns again, it's already mounted that immune response. You're prepared for that potential infection before you even take your first bite. Uh, Ada wondered if he could use these learned associations, these learned immune responses to treat disease. He, he wanted to know if we could use neutral psychological cues to get the same effects as with drugs. So he did an experiment on rats um, with the autoimmune condition lupus. So just as before, he taught the rats to associate a sweet taste with, with the immunosuppressant drug, cytoxan. And then he showed that once the association was learned, those rats with lupus did just as well, on, just with sweetened water and half their usual drug dose, as another group of rats did on their full drug dose. And then he got a call about a girl called Marette. This is Marette on the left. Um, she was from Minnesota, uh, and in 1983, when she was 11, she was diagnosed with lupus. So her immune system was essentially attacking pretty much every organ in her body. She suffered from kidney damage, seizures, high blood pressure, pneumonia, severe bleeding, um, despite taking steroid drugs to suppress her immune system. And when she was 13, her heart started to fail. So with her life in danger, her, her doctors wanted to give her cytoxan, the same immunosuppressant drug that Ada had been using with his rats. But Marette's mother was really worried about this. Um, cytoxan is horribly toxic. It has a long list of side effects. Its use in humans at the time was experimental. And she was worried that the cytoxan could be just as dangerous to Marette as her lupus. So. She had seen Ada's work, she was a psychologist, so she, she got in touch with him and asked whether it would be possible to use conditioning, a learned response, to help Marette to get the same effect from a lower dose of cytoxan. So Ada agreed to help, and they, he figured that they couldn't use saccharin, a sweet taste is, is too uh, familiar in people. We, we experience it all the time, we'd be unlikely to learn a particular association with a sweet taste and, and any drug effect. Um, so they decided to use a mixture of cod liver oil and rose perfume. They wanted something uh, unfamiliar, unforgettable, distinctive, something that was ideally hitting more than one sense. Um, so she was due to have monthly chemotherapy with a cytoxan, so for the first three months she had her drug alongside this cod liver oil and rose perfume mixture. And then after that three months, when she'd learned the association, she was given the cod liver oil and rose every month, and then the drug only every third month. So by the end of the year she'd had six doses instead of the normal 12. And she responded really well to that, just as well as the doctors had hoped she would from the full dose of drug. And so the, she got through that crisis in her condition, she was able to revert to milder drugs, and she eventually went on to college. Now, of course, that's just a single case study. You can't tell too much just from that. But this research has been continued by um, Manfred Schadlowski, who's working at the University of Essen in Germany. And he started working with rats. So again, he showed that he could train them to associate a sweet taste with another immunosuppressant drug. He was using a drug called cyclosporin A uh, and showed that, their, this, that then the sweet taste alone did suppress their immune systems. For example, they had lower levels of um, immune chemical messengers like interleukin-2 and interferon-gamma. 
And he also showed that once the association was learned, just the sweetened water, along with a very low drug dose, so so low that it wouldn't have any effect on its own, that was enough to prevent these animals from rejecting transplanted hearts. So a very dramatic effect on their immune systems. He also showed that this was mediated by the autonomic nervous system. If he cut the, the nerve in the rats that was running to the spleen, then the effect was completely blocked. He's working on people as well. Um, he's, uh, instead of cod liver oil and rose, he's developed this green drink. It's, um, it's made of strawberry milk, lavender oil, and green food colouring. Uh, I've tried it. It's absolutely disgusting. But it's... Um, <laughs> It's really distinctive, like you couldn't forget it. It's, it looks green, but it tastes purple because of the lavender, and it's, it's sweet, but also bitter, also um, and milky. Um, yeah, it's just unlike anything you've ever tried before, and it's hitting all these different senses at once. And, and Shedlowski has shown that um, if you drink this drink alongside taking this immunosuppressant drug, cyclosporin A, a couple of times, then afterwards, just drinking that drink on its own will suppress your immune system in the same way. And he's shown that in healthy volunteers, in patients with dust mite allergy, where it reduced their allergic response and the signs and symptoms of that allergy. Um, and he's now testing it in kidney transplant patients. So kidney transplant patients, of course, have to take immunosuppressant drugs to prevent rejection of the transplanted kidney. Um, but the trouble is that the drugs are themselves directly toxic to the kidney that you're trying to save. Um, and transplanted kidneys last just eight to 10 years on average, and as many transplanted kidneys are lost from the toxicity of the drugs as from immune rejection. Half of those patients who lose their kidneys die, the other half have to go back on di dialysis and wait for another kidney. So anything that could reduce drug doses um, would cut the side effects of those drugs and also hopefully help those kidneys to last longer. And I, I met a few different patients um, in Germany who were taking part in this trial. One of them was called Karl Heinz Wilbers. He's a retired psychotherapist. And he would take his drugs at the same time every morning alongside this drink and little ritual to learn the association. And he would all, always listen to the song Help Me by Johnny Cash. He was trying to create a little environment, hitting all his senses to try and make that association as strong as possible. Um, and another patient was a geologist called Barbara Novak, who was diagnosed with lupus in 1988, just a few years after Maret. She lost her kidneys to the disease. And she's now 46 and already on her third kidney transplant. Her latest kidney is five years old, but she's been told that it's aging more quickly than expected. And she told me that anything that could help to protect her kidney with a lower drug dose would be incredibly important for her. Now, so far, there's only been small trials in the transplant patients, but there are promising results that they are getting extra immunosuppression from this green drink in addition to their doses of drug. So the hope is, ultimately, that um, using distinctive tasting placebos, essentially, like this, along with drugs, could, could help to reduce drug doses in a range of autoimmune conditions and allergies, as well as transplants. Um, there have been trials in arthritis and psoriasis as well. Um, and this could help not just with immune conditions, um, because conditioned responses affect a lot of physiological functions. Um, and so there have been there's some animal research um, showing that the effects of chemotherapy drugs can be conditioned, for example, suggesting that this might help to reduce side effects of chemotherapy. There's a US clinical trial in ADHD, hyperactivity disorder, and they found that children did as well, if not better, on the placebo once the association had been learned, plus half a drug dose, as children did on their full drug dose. And neuroscientists in Italy are working with Parkinson's patients, um, showing that if the patients are trained by receiving several doses of their real drug, they then respond to lookalike placebos much more consistently and with as large a response as you get with the real drug. Um, so the hope is that you, they could then alternate drugs and placebos to, re, to get the same clinical benefit in those Parkinson's patients, but with lower drug doses, which would help to delay drug tolerance in those patients, which is a real problem in Parkinson's. So just to conclude, often when I talk about the role of the mind in health, there seems to be an assumption from both the, the converts and sceptics of mind-body medicine that I'm going to tell people to throw out physical drugs and treatments. But it's, it's really not a case of choosing either a physical or a psychological approach to treating disease. And I think conditioned responses are a great example of how we can use both of those together in an intelligent way. Unfortunately, this research has come too late for Marette. Um, she, she died from heart failure when she was 22. The damage to her heart from both her condition and the toxicity of those drugs that she had to take was just too great, ultimately. But the hope is, 
that this line of research that she helped to start um, could eventually allow us to use psychological cues to reduce drug costs, increase patients' quality of life, and to save lives. Thank you.